Hello, I'm James Carson, and this presentation is called The 10 Key Elements of Audience Building Content Strategy. It's a process that I've used on a number of large sites to grow audience and engagement. So the 10 key elements are persona research, message architecture, defining an information architecture, stock flow and curation, which is a planning technique, team workflow, genuinely good ideas, headlines, formatting, using multimedia, and constant review. So I'll go through each of these in a bit more detail and include some books that will be useful to you watching. For persona research, I recommend a book called Truth, Lies and Advertising, The Art of Account Planning by John Steele. It's a great book around asking the right questions of audiences and creating the right consumer research. Alongside that, we often start in SEO looking at things like keyword analysis, but with persona research, I'd like to go a bit deeper. So ask the questions on your own web analytics. Where are they? What are they doing? So which content are they engaging with the most? How are they getting there? From which traffic sources are they coming from? Then looking a bit further into other data, you might have an email database with useful data and customer segmentation. Uh, Follower Wonk is a very useful tool for finding out uh, Twitter biographies and Twitter activity. And then Facebook Insights, is great for demographic profiling and you might also be able to use on-site or off-site surveys such as Google or SurveyMonkey. So you want to end up with a picture like this or a snapshot. Let's say this example, British from London, Manchester or Leeds, 100 followers on Twitter, more active on Facebook than Twitter, creative type that likes music and design and a mean age of 21. Already with those five bullet points you have a pretty good understanding of your consumer and you'll be able to make content decisions based on that information. For instance, they like music and design, that might mean you create Spotify playlists or create a lot more graphical content than just writing. Since you've got this persona, you can now build up a message architecture because you know who you're talking to. And a great book around this is Positioning by Al Rees and Jack Trout. So we want to get to this kind of brand wheel and this is created through a card sorting exercise. So go and get some index cards, then um, put them in front of a group of stakeholders with different words or phrases upon them, and then these stakeholders sort them into different piles around the themes, how it makes me feel from the consumer's point of view, what it says about me, the personality of the brand, facts, icons, truths and beliefs, through the core values of the brand, and then you come to a brand essence. And a brand essence is a single statement around a brand. Beyond that, once you've done that card sorting exercise, you can come up with a message architecture. In this, you have a primary message and a secondary message. The first message is the most important thing you want your user to know or feel after viewing the content. And the secondary is a group of messages that support the primary message and provide further context. So an example might be ours at Carson Content. Uh, we want to be, although we're not necessarily yet, a UK thought leader in digital content strategy. We're direct and to the point, and we deal with matters of fact and logical explanation. So that's our primary message. Our secondary message is that we're satirical. We have a sense of humour that is derived and derived from criticism. We have a point of view that we aren't afraid to express. And then tertiary, we're the anti-hype. We view trends with a long-term view, and we believe in marketing's history. And there's a great example on the web um, of a really good message architecture and editorial style guide at voiceandtone.com. It's uh, MailChimp's guidelines around how to produce uh, great content. And it shows readers of this guide how to speak in the voice of Freddy, who is uh, the chimp, and how he talks to consumers in his jokey style. Next, number three, we have defining an information architecture. And the most useful book I've read on this topic is Card Sorting by Donna Spencer, a 140-page book about sorting out index cards, but it can really help you nail down what sort of categorization and topics you want on your website. So it's important to define what categories and tags are, and many people went to blogging without a real plan around what their categories and tags actually mean. Categories are topics that exist in a hierarchy and generally fill menus, Tags are a grouping of content that mentions a particular entity, most often proper nouns. They work like this. A category might have a set of contents and then other content within it. 
uh, which you can navigate to through being in that category, but you can also navigate across category from different related content through a tag. Let's say a category might be fashion, but a tag might be Kate Middleton. You might be able, you might be able to move from the fashion category to the beauty category because the same art, uh, an article is tagged Kate Middleton. How not to do it is like this, and sorry if you're from Debenhams, but this menu is quite poorly designed. It has fashion, lifestyle, weddings, designers, all of which could either be grouped under lifestyle or designers could be grouped under fashion. And then it also has page types at the same time, news, advice, and get involved. And it actually has some advisory articles which aren't tagged within advice. So it's actually a very confusing user experience. Number four is a planning technique called stock flow and curation. And it's best defined as this, first of all, this from a blog smart, smart market. Flow is the feed, it's the posts and the tweets. It's the stream of daily and sub-daily updates that remind people that you exist. Stock is the durable stuff. It's the content you produce that's as interesting in two months or two years as it is today. It's what people discover via search. It's what spreads slowly but surely building fans over time. So an example of stock might be guides, how-to, category pages, infographics and applications, although the latter two could also be potentially be flow. And flow could be news, social updates, or other content which is kind of timely, such as if you had a jobs website, opportunities. There's also curation, which is referencing things that aren't yours, getting your community to contribute, and harnessing social to create content. So it's about not being scared that the rest of the internet exists and linking appropriately to other great pieces of content. Finally, on planning techniques, we need to think about a rule called 70-20-10, um, kind of stolen from Google's principle that 70% of a team member's workflow should be focused on the core business, 20% should be experimental, and 10% should be highly experimental or high risk. So in content strategy terms, that means 70% of the content should be low risk, bread and butter marketing, 20% should innovate off what works, and 10% should be high risk ideas that will be tomorrow's 70 or 20%. So with a content split, we might have an evergreen website that has about 60% stock, 20% flow, and 20% curated content, and then 70% bread and butter, 20% innovative, and 10% high risk. So number five, we have team workflow. So this is the content marketing model, and it shows a kind of layer cake of different departments on which content marketing is reliant on. So at the bottom, we have analytics. On top of that, development, design, content, and outreach. So with content marketing, it's important not to just think about content and think about it as interlinked with other departments within the digital marketing or an organization. So these upward arrows explain the relationship between different departments. Analytics affects everything because what you can't measure, you can't improve. Outreach, for instance, is only really reliant on content because you're syndicating that content. You also have these sideward arrows, which represent the investment in different departments. Um, the bigger the size of the layer, the more investment in it. So in this example, we have content as the largest, which is about twice or three times as big as development. What, for who, and for how much is the way that we can measure production. So think about your skills of your team and in which format they can produce things. Is this writing, graphics, photography, or video? Uh, community, to whom are your team connected? So that might be the size of a writer's or content creator's social media following and who they can syndicate to. And then capacity is how much your team can produce. That might be in a writing context, 2,000 words a day, or if you're an infographic producer, once every two days. So think about what, for who, and how much. And you might find that a few content marketers can write, also produce video, and produce graphics. It's not like they'll be able to do analytics, development, design, content, and outreach, but you need to cover those five bases. 
So for genuinely good ideas, we have a formula which is borrowed from Chip and Dam Heath's book, Made to Stick. So good ideas according to them are simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional, and they have a story. So when we think of good ideas, think of in terms of simplicity, and are they graphics or statements that could easily be shared on social media? And these ideas, if, they, if you find they are shared and syndicated, might also work to create larger pieces of content. So here are four great ideas. Um, I particularly like the one from The Economist, which often has a lot of witty headlines like this. I've never read The Economist, management trainee age 42. And this one from Nike, who are pretty famous for their advertising, Michael Jordan 1, Isaac Newton 0. You wouldn't even need a powerful visual to explain that idea that Nike shoes help you beat gravity. And finally, on great ideas, I highly recommend reading The Copybook by DNAD. It's just a, it's a book completely chock full, every page, a great idea that you could take from and use from, to inspire your own content. Number seven is headlines, and possibly the most important uh, aspect of this whole presentation. Uh, and this quotes from Tested Advertising Methods from John Caples kind of sums it up. What do people see as advertising headlines? What do you, you yourself see of advertising as you glance through a newspaper or magazine? Headlines. What decides whether or not you stop a moment and look at an advertisement or even read a little of it? The headline. And if you changed advertising within that statement for website, you could get a very comparable statement for the modern day. And this is David Ogilvy talking in the 1960s. He said, on average, five times pe more people read the headline as read the body copy. When you have written your headline, you have spent 80 cents out of your dollar. So we've got two headlines here. Which do you think is the best? There's, do you make these mistakes in English? Or are you afraid of making mistakes in English? Well, for those who thought it was the bottom run, you're wrong, because this was split tested uh, in a direct mail campaign, and they found that the top one got far more responses. And the reason why is because it asks, if you make these mistakes in English, do you make these mistakes in English, pushes the reader to read the copy to find out if they do or don't. The second one, are you afraid of making mistakes in English, is a kind of yes or no question. It doesn't ask the reader to read the body copy. And there are three classes of successful headlines according to Capels. You have self-interest, so that might be how you can get a job at FHM magazine. The use of who, of course, creates self-interest. You have news, government unveils new apprenticeship scheme, anything to do with topical or timely events. Curiosity, do you, do you make these interview mistakes or wanted one billion pounds to tackle youth unemployment both are curiosity headlines. But curiosity is rarely enough on its own. The effectiveness of the average curiosity headline is doubtful. For every curiosity headline that succeeds in getting results, a double will fail. So if you do use curiosity in a headline, it's important to combine it with either self-interest or news. Three more things is that it's important to have a quick, easy way. That's why headlines with things like five steps to or three ways to your perfect bikini body might be quite successful. Then it's important to have short active verbs. So Greeks gain entry to Troy and win is not as good as Greeks seize Troy. And also it's important to eliminate negativity. No one wants to hear you whinging, although sometimes on the internet it does work to have an alternative point of view. Common sense SEO headlines are make on-page headlines as long as you like. Use full versions of proper nouns. Think of how people will search to come across your headlines. And then think about having one headline for robots and another for humans. If you use something like Yoast SEO plugin or Headspace on WordPress, you can control the browser title as well as the H1. So you can make two different headlines. Sometimes it's also important to create a headline for the category pages within a website. And then continue to apply the concepts that I've already explained. Number eight, proper formatting. And we have 
the Yahoo Star Guide as the kind of Bible for formatting editorial on the web. So how do users read on the web? Well, they don't, or maybe they do, according to this article by Colleen Jones. But according to a study by Jacob Nielsen in the 90s, he said people rarely read web pages word by word. Instead, they scan the page, picking out individual words and sentences. In research on how people read websites, we found that 79% of our test users always scanned any new page they came across. Only 16% read word by word. And it's worth asking yourself a question. When was the last time you went to a news site? Probably yesterday. But when was the last time you read a full article? Probably not yesterday. Since users don't read, we want short words, short sentences, and short paragraphs. Try and have one idea for paragraph, so don't have a paragraph that's like 10 lines long, should be two to three, and break things up with lists and images. So a little HTML cheat sheet, and it helps to know HTML if you're doing web editorial. Make sure you subtitle things in H2 or H3. Don't use strong old bowls, because then you'll have text that's the same, time, same size as your body text but just boldened, it's better to have a different size for subtitles. Center things like images, don't have aligned left images because it looks messy. Lists things, if you have pros with a list in it, you should probably break that up into the HTML list elements. And then block quotes, interesting stuff. Basically any quote that you have, make sure that you put it in block quotes. Number nine is using multimedia. And because users don't really read on the web, we need to think about producing video, graphics, or images to help users find information quickly and keep them engaged. So the first rule around this is don't use stock images unless you're really, really desperate. It's frankly too easy to make your own. We've got Instagram and more powerful applications like Snapseed to help you produce really good looking uh, photography on the fly. You can also create visualization rather easy from just using Microsoft Office. If you use Excel uh, with Word and have formatting options, then you can make something like this quite quickly. It's not the best looking thing in the world, but it says uh, quite quickly um, a particular point of view, probably better than writing it in text. And there are four data tools that I really recommend. First is Infogram, then you have Quipol, which is a yes or no polling tool. Poll Daddy, which is a very powerful application, particularly on the corporate account, and then Visually, which is another infographic creation tool. If you're creating video, then think about eliminating shakiness, bad lighting, or bad sound. Although if you want to edit it on the fly, you could use iMovie on iPhone. Most professionally video made video uses Premiere, um, and you normally need someone professionally trained to be able to use this application. Number 10 is constant review. And this is analyzing your work and having regular check-ins to think about what are your most successful content types or subject matters and then investing further in those. So the first thing around this I would say is to dashboard. Uh, you could use an application like Leftronic or Gecko Board to create a da dashboard that sources various types of data into one place. So you could have uh, your traffic data combined with your Twitter feed and your Twitter follow followers or even your YouTube subscribers all in one place. Next is to template email reports and send them out on a regular basis. So you can automate these via Google, via Google Analytics. You can send them daily, weekly or monthly. I recommend creating bespoke reports if you have the resource and sending them out every day, uh, particularly if you have an editorial team of two or more. Next, it's important to have your content creators set up to react against topical and timely events. So I seriously recommend that they either use TweetDeck or Hootsuite so they could re react to Twitter and what's happening there. But also creating dashboards on NetVibes with the demise of Google Reader, I highly recommend that, um, which they log on as their home screen every morning and see what their competitors and other uh, content creators in their space are creating. And then also Trends Map, which is a geo-located uh, Twitter trends map. You can put it over the UK and zoom in really, really quite closely into a local area and see what's trending there. 
I also recommend Souvle, which is a kind of Google suggest on steroids. It has Wikipedia, Amazon, Bing, YouTube, um, even Best Buy, I think, uh, suggest boxes. So if you type in um, how to, it will come up with suggestions from all these other networks too. So that's it. Those are the 10 key elements of audience building content strategy. If you are going to work with content teams or uh, review someone's content strategy, then I highly recommend looking deeper into each one of these before you move on to more complicated stuff. If you improve all of them by 20%, you'll almost certainly improve your audience size and your engagement. Thanks for watching. I'm James Carson. You can follow me on Twitter at Mr. James Carson.